was sitting on a log over the Catwood River, a fictional river, and I couldn't help myself from asking, what is the purest content? Something perfect. But what is content? Any showing whatsoever? And who determines perfection? We ourselves? Even the flowers silently listen in. You know, until recently in human history, we weren't connected like this. At light speed, with our eyes and ears to everyone else, what's been called the global theater. And it makes me wonder, will video rise to the level of scripture? Or was that just for the written word, thousands of years ago? Won't these videos be around even longer, for more senses and higher definition than those first leather-based texts? Or is art lost its power to fashion the absolute? to uncover an archaeological record at this point, the philosopher Graham Harmon believes that the first artwork was really the mask. Unless you so in honor of this speculation, my sister Makara and my dad made me a life mask. <laughs> we'll tell you Run. when to stop. Run! Six feet, six feet. Other speculations are that it was dance or makeup. Whatever that first artwork was, art is an artifact of human creation. Handmade beauties. And art has come a long way since then. We kept doing it. We got better and better. We kept doing it to the point where we were getting 3D artworks and and greater and greater artworks and renaissance upon renaissance and it was beautiful my god we painted god himself we probably shouldn't have done that but we kept going and the life uh, was just overflowing out of our art it will never ever stop we're the greatest species ever and we can prove it we can show you with these things we'll never stop renaissance and going and going and now we make it to Mars! Though I guess in that case it was a robot then. Some animals can do it too. But what is the greatest content of all time? Is it the terracotta army in China? The Mesopotamian ruins of Akkad? Is it this great cloud face sculpture that I can't find the name of? Or the pyramids of Egypt? Is it chapel ceilings? Or Katharina Gross's warehouse long paintings? Or the mausoleum of Shah i Chirach? Personally, I love listening to Glenn Gould play Bach, or Alice Coltrane, or Swans, or Busgate performances like you're hearing now. And my ideal content is abandoned building tours with applause on repeat in the background. And I love wisteria, sweaters, skyline. Or I imagine sitting around a fire with my favorite artists of all time, or watching the unfilmed Napoleon movie by Kubrick. And I love this video statue of my own head. But this, of course, is all too subjective. We have to start where all the ladders lie. Let's look into those sensitive membranes which all content opens to in the first place. Without them, there wouldn't be any content. Each sense creates its own space, faces its own odd spectrum of content. Aristotle told us that the first sense 
was touch, from which all the other senses stem. Touch is our most intimate and immediate contact with the outside world. Our interior sensitive bubble of touch is home base. The taste buds blossom on the tongue, but actually what we see are not the taste buds themselves, but more like shelters with them hiding underneath. Taste is the picky curator in the mouth that decides what comes in and what stays out. Smell is the most mute but memorable sense, whether pleasant or repellent. Many philosophers believe that morality stems from the nose. When you hear the word content, you probably think of these two senses, the eye and the ear, bringing what's distant as if it's near. Reaching the farthest beyond touch, the always open ear picks up the mood of rooms and far off ranges. And McLuhan pointed out, Acoustic space is a sphere who we hear from all directions at once. The ear cannot fix its gaze, but it can listen in. And it is believed that even plants have a form of hearing. And only recently was it discovered that the eardrum tilts in the direction of the eye. The organ which gives us light, darkness, and colors through its ridiculously beautiful stained glass windows. It unveils a landscape of the scalable surface of things. In the most literal meaning of the word, they are the video senses. All of these senses are gathered, connected, and intermixed in the brain. The sense organs do not blossom from the brain. The brain is the last to blossom. Before then, there were only loosely connected sensitive nets, perhaps first seen in the glass sponge or in slime mold. But the story of media doesn't end at our sense organs. As Joyce and McLuhan figured out, content is not only shaped by our bodies, but all our tools, which transform all creation and consumption. First of all, the eye is extended by eyeglasses and sunglasses, which are older than you might have thought. And reading devices are a strange sort of optical instrument. Then there are scopes extending sight in both directions, into deep space and into the grubbery. Light bulbs which illuminate dark spaces, painting tools, drawing tools, and other tools for capturing images, and most notably, cameras, which mimic the organ itself. And don't forget the projectors and screens, which open up whole simulated worlds for the eye of the beholder. Next we have the ear, extended first by amphitheaters and hearing horns. Telegraphs, amps, instruments, and the microphone mimicking the eardrum. Speakers which simulate and enhance soundscapes. And recording devices allowing infinite grooves. Synthesizers, radios, telephones, and the most beautiful compact discs. Next, the hands. Writing with pencils and typing with keyboards. Some of our first tools were stone clubs, Crushers, gavels, beaters, spearheads, skewers, mallets, drivers, and hammers. hammers. I love hammers. Forks have arms, palms, and fingers. The arm is extended by saws, rods, and bats. We play, build, and discover the world with hand tools. On the other side of the body, we have shoes. I mean, the feet, extended by stirrups, which gave us horse legs, and most famously, the wheel, affording us new landscapes while changing the ground under our feet and making us the fastest animal on Earth. And there are many, many other uses for wheels. The head pocket sound-making mouth has many extensions. Is mayonnaise an instrument? Debatably including food, or at least the way we cook our food. This is most obvious with our spoons, spatulas, and spotted scrubbers, which mimic the tongue itself. And the bag, which also carries things. And we can't leave out the nose enhancers. Ah, and now we hit the technology right under you. The sofa, chair, or bed. An extension of, well, the booty. 
and the flesh in general. Meanwhile, the skin is extended by clothing. Aw, oh, clothing. And hats. So much more than bare skin could ever be. The weaved world of fashion. Below we find the muscles, extended by bricks, cement, the stuff that holds up the world. And our skeleton is extended by the frames of our shelters, like exoskeletons. Then there are literal exoskeletons and creepy automata. The internal organs are also extended and mimicked, like the lungs which give us power, or the heart which becomes like the infrastructural veins of our homes. And the dam is an extension of, well, the combustion engine mimics the stomach, while a more direct extension would be our sewers, our plumbing, and our drains. But probably most relevant to us presently is how electricity directly extends our nerves and neurons. There are an order of magnitude more transistors in the world today than insects. All of us connected at nearly light speed through games, videos, the internet, like one big interconnected nervous system. Especially with advents in artificial intelligence, we are directly mimicking and extending the brain itself. Just as I was wrapping up recording over that brain scan, Francis alerted me to a seizing, contorting, Ronette Pulaski-looking squirrel in the front yard. Boo! She kept charging toward us. You must be rabid. And getting a little bit too close to the neighborhood cat. My cousin Gabe, with the spiritual gift of health insurance, made first contact. It turns out that the poor baby had lost her family, was dehydrated and malnourished, and because local animal control was offering no real help, we decided to take her in. And we named her Chili after Skyline. I quickly fell in love, and I was just baffled that Chili and I share all the same sense organs. The only thing we don't share is human language. Language is a part of our organism, and no less complicated. It is the most massive and inclusive art we know a mountainous and anonymous work of unconscious generations. It was the origin of stories, and some have said, as the wheel did for the foot, language did for the mind. The mother of all media, that fountain of utterance and innovation. Language is like the house of our inner being. It's an endless back and forth between the eye and the ear, a symbiosis or synesthesia between the image and the sound. It is the medium we think through that we explore both the inner and outer world, the medium which made humanity. Wow, yeah, that's right, Chili. Speech came first. Even squirrels have a different word for up danger and down danger. Thank you, Chili. Have a sweet day. Ble love ya. Yeah, so how did, it, how did it all start? It probably started with mating calls and hating calls and onomatopoeia or ho-he-ho -ho worker synchronization and whatever this is. Calling my mother's attention to my hunger. And as I opened my mouth to receive the nipple, ma, lo, I had invented a primal word, ma, mother. Ah, uh, yes, maybe it was mommies and music. Speaking in tongues of fire, babbling until something sticks into grooves which instinctually resonate with us, capturing each other's attention. Every word is like a compact, coded poem. The most familiar root denoting bigness is GR, grr, the growling of the big tiger, producing all those big words, grande, 
grandir. They're great! It's almost like we humans were just built to speak. The throat, the eight-muscled tongue, the mouth and lips make up the most intricate instrument on Earth. Though this beautiful morphology comes at a cost, we die from choking ten times more than any other animal. But back to the plus sides, we have an oceanic range with our waving vowels and crashing consonants. Including Chile, everyone on Earth agrees that speech came first. Some say it was even the first act in the cosmos. God spoke, and there it was. After that, Adam gets the enviable privilege of naming all the animals, and the Tower of Babel splits up everyone's speech. But what about writing, which marked the beginning of recorded history? The story of the gift of writing plays an important role in almost every world religion. The word for writing usually translates to holy pictures. The oldest origin story of writing is about the African goddess of wheat, Nisaba, in order to record, you know, quantities of wheat. Another is the Mesopotamian god Enmerker, who invented writing because his mortal mailman kept forgetting his messages. Then there's Fu Shi, who is said to have defined the basis for the I Ching from tortoise shells. The tortoise is wise. The myth of the four-eyed Kung Ji is probably my favorite. He had the idea to make the imprints of everything, as if they had fallen from the heavens themselves. Then Odin hung himself upside down from a tree for some reason, which somehow gave him the runes. And then there's the most recent myth of the Korean Kongol. The emperor made up that the letters had miraculously appeared on the leaves, but really he had painted them with honey for the bugs to eat out. Perhaps the strangest is the hermetic myth of Logos, that an Egyptian demigod, Hermes, Mercury, and even Moses are really the same story. A mortal given the words of God in order to redeem the catastrophe started by language itself, meaning the fruit of knowledge like that offered by the talking snake, and that Jesus was somehow the word made right. Writing, essentially, gave us humanity, gave us architecture, scalable economies, mathematics, philosophies, sciences, and even medicine. And I can see the world through the eyes of someone 3,000 years ago, just as well as if they were alive today. Visual space is the only space that is lineal and connected. A word selects and distills things from their specific contexts and details into simpler general outlines. Pictographic representations of relatively concrete things. The word opens and sharpens the whole range of intelligibility, not just in our dealings with others, but within ourselves, all through that common synesthesia. When we read, we use the eye as an ear. We hear what we see. And every word in every language is a double metaphor on arrival, a sound into an image, and then back into a sound, like a germ form of video, even with a soundtrack. Phonetic alphabets read like hallucinatory sheet music, though even our alphabet has pictographic roots. In honor of this fact, I got a tattoo of the history of the letter A, which was for Oxhead. B was for house. C was for throw stick. D was for dagger. E was for walking person, F is for mace, G is for door or door handle, H is for window or fence, I is for limb, J is for bent limb, K is for palm or cup, L is for prod, maybe the prod you do with your tongue when you say it, M is for water, beautiful, N is for snake, O is for mouth, no, I? I thought, okay, well, P is for mouth, I guess. Q is for knot or copper. R is for the head. S is for teeth. And T is for mark. U, V, and W are for hook. X is for support and fish. Y is for legs or yoga. And Z is, strangely, for padlock. So before we get on our way, I just want to take a second to already enjoy the ride. It's going to be good. Oh, shoot. Wow. Okay, I guess that's the, uh, that's the magic of editing. I, get, I hope we're going to be okay. You know, let's, let's uh, go back. Okay. This is nice. 
This is what it's going to be like. Smooth sailing. Just really smooth. Oh. I didn't expect that. How did that clip get in there? Oh. Gosh. Okay. Um. Sure. Language has totally changed with video. We somehow shoved lightning bolts into rocks and made them sing. Present any image the eye can capture. In the immediate playback of the things which paintings and speech could previously only allude to, has made the old language technically obsolete. And if language is what made us human, what are we now? Literacy had uh, very strange antecedents, very strange effects on people, and uh, we're only beginning to notice what those effects were now that it tends to be pushed aside. Language is a technology, and Simone Don showed us that technology progresses from abstract extensions of our organs, like the hammer, to concrete replicas of them, like the mechanical arm, from the abacus to AI. And so language too, with the leap from the ancient ear, to the microphone, and from crude stencils to a replica of the eye itself in the camera. Into the insane ability to give each other the first-person experience of things themselves. It's an extraordinary super language. Through it, we can sing the same songs, dream the same dreams, throughout the species, making the Tower of Babel look like a pile of Legos. It is a rectangular piece of mica. We had an explosion for the video senses, a series of great leaps from paper to cathodes to pixels to worldwide streams of video. All previous books, images, ideas, albums, films, shows, almost every person, man, woman, camera, TV in our pockets. But where? Where is it all headed? It's hard to say because we are in the cave art stage of this. McLuhan in the 50s predicted the internet, saying the next medium, whatever it is, will be the direct extension of consciousness. And we will wear all mankind as our skin, giving us memes, the uh, democratic perfection of the pictograph. Finally, in the information age, we got a pure definition of content. The father of the information age, Claude Shannon, mathematically defined it not as a solid block of perfect storage, but as a genuine bit of surprise. It drips all night before my heart. So, paradoxically, more information means more uncertainty, more entropy, in thermodynamic terms, more information is hot, and less is cold. The incomplete form allows the audience more participation than the completed form. Just as our computers convert hot electrical signals into ice-cold code, whether we see, hear, taste, touch, read, record, think, or hallucinate, the hot, open input of surprising details is cooled down into sensible outlines. Content could literally be anything. I was going to show pimples here, but a rotting banana will do just fine. What we're interested in is what happens when you mix hot and cold, light on and light through, the highest possible quality mixed with the most involving content. Would it open up a vortex of unforeseen hypnotic harmony? Let's return to the original question. What is the purest, most potent form of content? Yep, there it did it. And the grand prize winner, the Hypnotoad. In a few moments, he will think of the funniest joke in the world. As a result, he will die laughing. <laughs> no one could read it and live. In every compassionate white boy's favorite movie, Synecdoche, New York, the director tries to make the perfect play. He goes as far as to build a full-size replica of New York City within a warehouse. What? When are we going to get an audience in here? It's been 17 years. And there's a full-size replica in there, too. 
his life falls apart and the attempt and failure at perfect content. Very depressing. In Alejandro Jodorowsky's film The Holy Mountain, a magician director takes the audience on a vision quest to pure content. But by the end, he reveals its trickery. And in the book Infinite Jest, the perfect movie is finally made, but it's used as a weapon of mass terrorism. The problem with the movie Infinite Jest is that it's, it's lethally entertaining, meaning it's, watching it is so much more fun than doing anything else. Once somebody's watched it once, they pretty much have the spiritual energies of a moth and want to uh, do nothing more than watch it again and again and again. And isn't this kind of where we are today? Our species has to reckon with an infinitely receding rabbit hole of entertainment. Everything's addicting. I, for one, spend nearly all my time trying to be entertained. It's horrible. Involving more and more of our lives. Why ever stop watching? Clickbait, viral videos, pictures, forums, and memes, and even the faintest of human interests. Spectacle upon spectacle. The world is spectacular. We are re-entering the old tribal world. About this time we're going to go through the tribal dance and the tribal dream wide awake. It isn't quite right to say attention spans have shrunk. Oh. Now, every day, we co-edit a long feature film on our phones and computers where you could quite literally consume your whole life away. The most potent form of content are drugs. The original content enhancers, like plugging our nervous system into an amp, entertaining us from the inside. In the brave new world, there's a drug called Soma, the perfect drug. All the benefits of religion and alcohol with none of the drawbacks. Of course, it doesn't end well. There's also the mythic drug of panacea, and in Dune, the cataclysmic drug called the spice. In this time, the most precious substance in the universe is the spice melange. He who controls the spice controls the universe. The greatest danger with drugs is that they work. They really work. They really seem to fill an eerily deep hole in us. The hot noise in us becomes pure pleasure. The cold forms in us become a vague sense of peace. Heroin now kills more people than car crashes, including five good friends so far. It can make the essential look inessential and vice versa. So potent that it backfires and becomes impure. The word desire literally means lack of a star. I look at pleasure and I kind of get scared, and I, I would definitely say pleasure is not happiness. Okay. Because I think you, 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 I kill pleasure. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I take too much of it in and therefore make it non unpleasurable. Yeah. And there is no pleasure that I haven't actually made myself sick on. <laughs> and, um... I had a roommate from church camp who got really obsessed with Halo 3. His parents banned violent video games outright, so his dad took his copy of Halo 3 and... Mark put the game in a lockbox, right next to his 9mm pistol. My roommate got into the safe, took the game and the gun, and shot both of his parents in the head, killing his mother instantly and wounding his father for life. The judge wondered if the video games were the cause or something. Whatever it was, my friend totally lost sight of what was real and essential. Users who may no longer distinguish between reality and make believe. Oh, friends, where are we heading? The line of progress in our media technologies definitely tends toward more immersion for more senses. An unceasing march toward this. We're all strapped into this roller coaster. Yeah.
Not unlike the abuse of potent drugs, virtual realities risk our preference for a fictional world over the real one. It could augment every sense of space. Who doesn't want perfect, complete control over their environment, down to the smallest details? A whole world becoming an extension of your own private consciousness and whim. An indistinguishable high definition through nano-perfect lenses. But we humans have a tendency to adapt abruptly and crudely to innovations. Just like clothing lost us our fur, cooking dulled our teeth, how baby-like will we get with future technologies? Will we lose touch with reality in the future? Leaving the outside world to drift off? These great dangers of media were already profoundly realized by the ancient Greeks in the tragedy of Narcissus and Echo. One of the ironies is we usually focus just on Narcissus, so let's start with Echo. She was once a great singer and smooth talker, until one day she got cursed by the jealous goddess of writing. She was damned to only repeat whatever she last heard. She fled to the woods, where she witnessed the beauty of Narcissus, and ashamed of herself, began stalking him from afar. Echo, repeating what she last heard, yelled out to Narcissus, Yo! Then ticked up some flowers and waited in the bush. Narcissus came, heard the rustling in the bush, and said, Who's there? To which Echo jumped out and said, Who's there? Narcissus cruelly rejected her, saying, I'd rather die than have you love me. Love me! Love me! She repeated. Rejected and depressed, an angel of sort takes pity on Echo and curses Narcissus for his blindness to others, giving him a similar fate. He falls in love with his own reflection, damned to stare at it constantly, wasting away at the river where actors would hang out. Finally, he longs so badly for his lover, he falls in and dissipates into his reflection. Echo, heartbroken by his death, leaves for the mountains again, where she too withers into whatever sound is last spoken. This is more than a story about self-love and unrequited love gone wrong. Narcissus and Echo represent a danger in media in general, in the video senses in particular. Both give the illusion that what is distant is near, but the eye tempts with the illusion that one's perspective is supreme, while the ear tempts with musical illusions with no point of view of its own. All media is like a mask with this strange dual aspect. They veil reality, hiding it, and yet are the only available face of it. And so we're left to wonder, do we have the true face of reality or just a reflection? The true voice or just an echo? Both could be tragically confused. Thus, we're always at risk of preferring what is only fictionally good, true, and beautiful. A dark cloud forms above all our art, content, technology, and knowledge. Do we have any pure and direct access to the absolute? How can we know it's true? Behind the reflections, echoes, and masks. And now, a word from our sponsor. Conor Oil! On those dark and dreary days when you feel lost and alone, just remember, the only love is self-love. Do you feel depressed? Like an alien in your own land? Your own job? your own home. Like all neighbors have been replaced by influencers and all work replaced by a game. Many say there's no reason left to hope that the world will be directed by the rich and elite, not the families, artists, and workers who build it. That sickness is more profitable than health and war than peace and that all mankind wants just one gross thing. But we will walk around the world 
the sun will set like a scar between the darkness and the dawn. And there will rise a great red star. Seize the moment. Seize the means of production. We'll deal with the government. We're twins. She has astigmatism. Are you ready? For the only crime show that begins at the root of a evil. It's called... <laughs> Primeval. <laughs> and now, our feature presentation. The purest content can't simply be the highest definition or most entertaining. That could always lead us back to the dangers of fiction. We must find the truest, most essential content there is. Bringing source behind all content, the medium of mediums, and wonder of wonders. There must be some pure meaning, some absolute truth we can dig up and grab hold of. Why is there anything rather than nothing? Are we inside a larger story? Do we have a purpose? How can we know it? First, let's look up at the heavens above us. Those grand skies that yearn with mystery. What is the structure of the cosmos as a whole? As we look for this, out as far as we can, the edges of space endlessly recede beyond our grasp. And when we try to peek into those pockets of pure space-time, we discover only a cold, lightless blankness, frozen like in a dreamless sleep. On top of that, about 95% of the material needed to make sense of the world we see is just missing. It's either that, or there's some fundamental problem of the measurement of masses in space-time. No ultimate shape and structure of the cosmos has been observed. We come out with only deeper and darker mysteries. We can find no standpoint outside it all, and so no pure information is gained, left in the cold. So, no problem. Let's turn our gaze down into what we can observe directly. The tiniest particulars which everything we see is made up of, right? Putting aside the 95% of pure darkness that we can't observe nor explain, perhaps the answers are down here. What could be purer content than a quantum drop of light or a fundamental particle? But we find down here a superabundance of information, overflowing all possible cups we bring to it. Maximally hot, surprising, and uncertain, because the more we try to pin down its position, the less we know of its trajectory. We find no vantage point below it all, too much to ever grasp at once, only noise. Whatever, you can't tell if you're looking at a live or dead cat on that level anyway. Chemists already know that stuff can't simply be reduced to its pieces. Hydrogen and oxygen don't have watery qualities at all. This true centerpiece of science is hardly tempted by any theory of everything, any final ground or surface at all. Finding about a million new substances every year, it finds a constantly shifting landscape of infinitely many levels. So science is improvable in both senses of the word both always getting better, yet always incomplete. Okay, so... Blackness above, white noise below. Gotta remember why we're in this cave. What content is most essential? Even if we could observe directly something about nature, that wouldn't tell us what we ought to do with it, or what it wants. That is the question of meaning. But what is meaningful? 
Let's look in that great pantheon of norms, values, and wisdom that's been passed down for thousands of years. Maybe it's distilled something pure. Humans used to live by epic poems and grand myths which bound together our guiding purpose. The stories that are associated with our deepest moral intuitions are pragmatic truths. The truths that enable you to act in a manner that best improves the probability, roughly speaking, of your existence and your reproduction maximally. Well, I guess my first question is, which myth, which tradition, the one you're born into? I mean, just that question alone is the reason for approximately every war. On top of that, these archetypal traditions are often used to back up many evils, to give them the ring and shine of the good, true, and beautiful. And worse still, myths only chronicle who we have been, and what has helped humanity in the past could destroy it in the future, because things genuinely change, and not responding to those changes could be the most impure and damning choice of all. Archetypes become cataracts. The traditions of the past can only give us ancestor echoes. But just as science is always improving and disproving myths, perhaps also culture is progressing, becoming enlightened. Finally, all woke up from the fictions and evils of the past, becoming like one big compassionate megazord of unified human values. Maybe we should just go with the flow. Open ourselves up to the world's values and let the cream rise to the top automatically. But the problem is, when we look at the top where that cream should be, we tend to find only surface level, contradictory cliches. Consider these cliches. Better safe than sorry. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Birds of a feather flock together. Opposites attract. Clothes make the man. Don't judge a book by its cover. Everyone can spot a phony. Fake it till you make it. Be positive. Expect the worst. Nothing ever changes. The only constant is change. Actions speak louder than words. The pen is mightier than the sword. Try, try again, but don't beat a dead horse. Everything happens for a reason. The flutter of a butterfly can change the world. Don't bite off more than you can chew, but hitch your wagon to the stars. Go with the flow, or any dead thing can go with the flow. Only a living thing can swim against it. Especially with the internet, you could spend your whole life going down rabbit holes of social reactivity caught in a disorienting echo chamber. Clichés and archetypes lead to an infinite vortex of confusion. Both modernity and tradition are stupid, could end the species, and both suffer echo's danger, the echo of the herd. Besides, it's no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a sick society. So, let's go deeper, to the springing source of all these meanings, the mind itself. Whether any meaning is taken on, ultimately depends on your own preferences, beliefs, and decisions about what is good, true, and beautiful. And there seem to be two primary meanings for meaning, riding down the middle of each individual psyche. We can think of them as Nietzsche and Freud did, as Dionysus and Apollo, or as the id and the ego, the warm, tonic streams of sensation and the frozen, ideal crystals of rationality. The sensitive Dionysian id is the older of the two, the primordial sense of meaning, those immediate impulses and physiological rapture of pain and pleasure, beauty and disgust. Dionysus tells us, Give up that search for absolute ideals. Live for what looks and feels good. What else do you really have to go on anyway, he gurgles. All your choices come down to what is hot to you. But appearances and feelings are famously slippery, as we've already seen. Many feel like they're pulling us up to heaven when they're really sliding us down into a hell world. And could we even have a civilization if we were just running on these animal instincts? What appears true may be false. Feels good may be bad. So, 
is the answer in the ego? I know that sounds weird, but by ego, I really mean the thing that gives us reason, which most philosophers and scientists agree is what separates us from other animals. Sorry, I just really love this video. Okay, can we overcome mere appearances and our animalistic feelings to uncover the origins and aims of being itself? Despite lacking any observable truth about nature, maybe reason can descend and discern the causal structure of the cosmos. Let's start here and now. What the heck is space and time? Well, this one's easy. Rulers measure space, clocks measure time, frozen stuff and melting stuff. But how can we ever tell what's a frozen real thing in the world, or just some icy idea in our heads? Or if we're experiencing the genuine flow of time, or just the flow of our own experience? Okay, not that easy. In fact, this is the problem at the bottom of all epistemological and engineering problems there are. Where do we draw the lines? The closest science has come to understanding space and time came with Einstein's special synesthesia, when he demonstrated that light could be treated as if it were a sound, bouncing around at a finite speed, thus proving the relativity of time to space. But even this ingenious invention cannot account for the essence or origins of being in time. Is it pure, rational forms underneath it all? Maybe it all started with laws, but then they'd have to be self-legislating laws. Or maybe it's vibrating atoms or strings plucked by an invisible hand. So maybe an absolute entity with nothing outside its control. Creating something outside its control, dang it. And if it's chaos all the way down, then how do we account for the emergence of structure? And, and if it's a structure all the way down, then how do we account for change? And combining these into a Frankenstein theory of everything sounds nice, but it just compounds all these problems. Anytime we reduce the world to one surface or ground, space and time get tied into knots. As soon as we find the boundary of our environment, or logic, it's no longer the boundary. We look for universal principles behind it all, but find no universal medium everything else can be reduced to, because no amount of detail can make the map become the terrain. There seems to be an ambiguous black hole underneath all our sensations and logic, and this is the reason for the constant incompleteness of our knowledge. And it gets even worse. Goodall's incompleteness theorem, after giving this existential crisis to mathematics, went on to show that this crisis even held in the kingdom of computers, proving that no piece of software for the rest of time would be invulnerable to a fatal bug or crash. Our concepts are thrown over things like dresses. All of reason's maps are made of and limited by their own medium, which is, well, us. Our own finite minds. That little caricature artist inside all of us. We can't possibly fit the infinitely high resolution of reality into our own finite minds and sense organs. We can only take in a sliver and even that sliver itself is instantly and immeasurably filtered and distorted. At best, we have working metaphors for the things at hand. It's fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. Pure fiction. So the problem with knowledge is not like having a scratch CD. It's more like trying to throw a scratch CD into the Grand Canyon to give birth to a new moon or a TLC show. And we can't think of the world outside of us without instantly turning it into a thought inside of us. Our knowledge never arrives because it never really leaves in the first place. Well, shoot. Each of us is totally trapped in our own cave, our own little sensorium and its language. And there's no way to step outside our bodies into a disembodied, objective perspective. Both our most raw and immediate sensation and our purest, most abstract rationality helplessly slip into the narcissist danger. 
We have no direct access to reality outside our own sensual noise, our reflections and echoes. So we're stuck with imperfect content, which could utterly backfire and destroy the species. The most unnerving thought. It seems the only way to avoid falling into the fictions and distortions is to admit a complete unknowing. anything is real, but that doesn't mean there is no reality, just that none of our truths, none of our content, can ever do it justice. I sense that there's something real and even holy, and I haven't even come close to it yet. But how? Where? I wanted to make a nature documentary, a mystery nature documentary, where even technology, art, the internet, and knowledge were treated as nature. But I have no idea what nature is. None. I don't think it's all interconnected, as is usually thought. I don't think flowers, atoms, bees, rivers, stars, and Spanish moss all lump together into one thing called nature when humans aren't around. I think they too are finite. Perhaps reality has her reasons for keeping veiled. Media are that which hide in the background behind any content, providing the invisible conditions for the visibility of that content. Like us, all other things have to relate to each other through their own filtered, sensual portraits of each other. And this is a beautiful thought to me, but it's also kind of terrifying, because it means everything in the cosmos is limited, vulnerable, and no pure access, no pure content, is even possible. I'm in front of a blank page, torn between zero and infinity. Anything could happen here, in my own little cinematic universe. Is this the best I can do with it? How do I know? I don't. I'm searching for some... something, some feeling. Everything feels both too much and not enough. You gotta sing something, man. <laughs> my mother taught my siblings and I that entertainment is not a lowly thing. It's basically a religious duty. The only real hope. And my dad would say, just be lighthearted and go viral. You have to go viral, you just click on it. Put it in the viral app. Alright, I'll make a viral video. Ready? And this advice seems to be working out for my siblings pretty well. My older sister was literally Mrs. Ohio and is the strongest person I know. And my older brother is an unparalleled musician and rock star. And my younger sister is the funniest and most successful young woman I've ever even heard of. And I'm... Come on, think. What is your greatest possible project? What would use all your best qualities? What are those again? My perfectionism feels like a hostage situation, where I'm both the hostage and the terrorist somehow. 
Over a million words written for this, 16 hours of music written for films I've never made, 10,000 videos sorted into pretty piles, endless images, countless drafts. I had a nine hour cut of this movie you're watching. The language part was two hours, like a bee gathering way too much honey, not even able to get off the ground. And my mind is consumed from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed and all of my dreams. It's all about this. Meanwhile, my life around me is so out of focus. Thinking over my time with Francis, what was on my mind? I'm hardly here. So many moments lost. I feel like I'm gonna die unspent. Why am I in this weird body? It's never enough. And I could keep editing this forever, build it up and watch it fall a million times off screen. And for what? I knew this project was impossible from the beginning. What is wrong with me? I was diagnosed with schizophrenia a couple times, but I think that was bread related. All right, now I need you guys. I think I'm okay now. Right? All right, smile. Two great fears, dying and creating for an audience. I was showing me on the TV. Why do they feel so similar? <laughs> That's right. I need to get beyond this. I want to give you watching this a gift. To get there, we have to take a strange route. You yourself. This video is going directly into your retinas. Maybe alone. Maybe you're with others. You're likely not outside, like you might read a book. But maybe you are. Weird. Each and every person watching this is watching at a different time. At least a different time in their lives. From your birth to your death, you are cut off from everyone and everything around you. So amazingly cut off in that deep, inescapable cave there. And I want to account for all of this, everything I can about what's going on inside of you as you watch this. I'm looking for you, even haunted by you. Maybe one day at Disney World, we sat back to back. I overheard you laugh and didn't know it. Maybe we have some mutual connection which would shock both of us. Or maybe you and I went driving one night, and seeing the people in traffic pass by, you wondered, where are they all going? What are they all doing with their lives? Even when glimpsed in real life, people only see a cartoon of you. Honestly, I have no idea what you want, what your memories are, what you think is good. So what the heck could I give to you? Wouldn't I have to know what your thoughts are before you even think them? Where do they come from? Who are you? I'm nobody. I'm nobody. Are you nobody too? Then there's, then a, there's pair a pair of us. us. Don't tell. Don't tell. They banish us, you know. How dreary to be, be somebody. somebody. How, How public, public like, like a frog. frog. When you go to sleep, in that deepest inner privacy, a theater opens up behind your forehead. And in your dreams, you encounter your very own holographic stream of self-creating content, untouched, unseen by anyone else. Are we directing or just watching? Where do they come from? Why? It's just as mysterious with our waking life. But what if I could find some alien technology which could tap into that deepest source in you and make you say, with total sincerity, that was it. That was pure. That was for me. What if I met you deeper than face to face, closer than ear to ear, hearing each other's inner caves, pupil to pupil, seeing each other's inner light, meeting at some source that you and I share,
if I could find just the right sequence of images and sounds, make an adaptive mirror to your soul, what's the best thing to do with this relationship? Tell me the first token that passed between you and me. I'd love to give you some new interest in your own life or make you remember the first thing you ever saw, show you your life task or something. But this is best case scenario, and I don't know you. And this distance is so real. I wish you could know how my soul has loved you. Even though when, when I, I call to you, it's not yet, yet with me. names and likely never will be. No ghosts live in there, he said. That made me sad. We are like ghosts to each other, yet still alive, wandering the earth. What is this? This strange desire behind every video to connect, to take each other. Where? What is the best thing to do with this strange, estranged connection? So strange. I've become a hologram passed between hardware and software, recorded in the past. You are the real one right now. I may even be dead. And you are a black hole to me as I write this. And I grasp at you, but only fictionally. And even if we could connect, where are we supposed to go? This is me genuinely trying to pray for the best possible content that I can give to you. This is going to be tough because I don't think I believe in God. I stand behind what I found in the cave. But at the beginning of this, I wondered if video could rise to the level of scripture. I mean, what purer content than the good news, right? Religion has been the highest art form for mankind so far. Five times a day, billions of people turn toward a piece of art. They empty themselves and aim their senses like antenna, reaching out for some pure, mysterious signal in the sky. Claiming to capture the essence of God. The premier work of man, perhaps, in the whole Western world. And it's without a signature. Scripture. Like a peak behind the great veils. Like we're on the inside of the greatest story ever told. The script to life. And a good sermon, speaking with the voice of God somehow about anything at all. Believing every word, that sweet promise of redemption, a realm of pure contentment when we die. But the first time I felt I glimpsed God was in the Prince of Egypt, that cold fire. I always felt jealous of the people in those stories who had seen God with their own eyes. And I wondered why God only appeared back then. Why did he stop? Why can't we get that on video just once? So problems came up with believing all of this. Problems like, did God make man or did man make God? <clears throat> well. And was that God's voice or just my own? Or the echo of the herd around me and before me? But I think the biggest problem in me believing all of this came when I met Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists who loved their god and religion with the same love I loved mine. I had believed that they worshipped deceptions, that they had built their lives around fictions and were like a different species spiritually, and denied the knowable truth that I somehow had, having happened to be born into Ohio to Christian parents. I could no longer buy that. Also. I was taught the world would likely end before I hit 25, so I never really thought about the future. 
the ending was just on the next page. And this really depressed me as a kid, so when I rejected religion for the first time, it felt, perversely, like being born again. Into the flame, into the fire, with no regard for a thing but that I'm the lord of the game. I am the god of hellfire! If you're a believer watching this, you're maybe starting to feel a bit uncomfortable. And if you're a non-believer, you're probably wondering, wait, why is he still trying to pray? Not sure. But please, I think there are at least three things we all can agree on. One, just as our content can't do justice to any reality, if there is anything like a god, none of our images can do it justice. We cannot fit the infinite into the finite. All our images and ideas of God are inadequate, incorrect. And this turns out to be a part of every major religion I've studied, though most often overlooked. This deep humility that none of us know the true face of God, what God really wants. Many people think it's not idol worship so long as they don't have a statue in front of them. All the while, they maintain these clean, rigid statues of God in their heads, like Adam and Eve in the garden. We use these beliefs to hide our true nakedness. They cover for us. Both the fundamentalist believer and the secular nihilist are guilty of reducing the world to mere images of it. Just one clings to these images, while the other dispenses with them. That damn tree of knowledge keeps sprouting up everywhere. I hope you agree. We should melt down our idols with the fire of honesty, and offer them up to the unknown. The second thing I hope we can all agree on is Ayn Rand, Bill Gates, this baby face mask, Greta Van Fleet, Dennis Prager, Funko Pops, Takashi69, Jeff Bezos in a robot suit, this photo of Obama with bangs, Kenneth Copeland, Charlie Kirk, these photos, people who don't like Twin Peaks, and the movie Downsizing all exist. And three, on a totally unrelated note, this world around us is not heaven. Oh shoot, that just reminded me. My first religious experience wasn't the Prince of Egypt. It was actually the Elephant Man, when I was six years old. It was the first time I remember ever crying over someone else's suffering. Even if we can't agree that God exists, no one can deny that suffering is real. The abuse of innocent souls, the death of loved ones. A piece of me is always buried with the dead. No more light through their eyes, only light on their heavy boxes and reminders that life is incomplete, missing them. These strike me as the deepest impurities and imperfection with reality. I know this is tough, but hang with me. Why isn't this heaven? Is God disgusted? Too angry to even look? Withholding his heaven? It's in his power to make this heaven. If he can't, he's not God. Because he doesn't, he's not good. The ancient problem of evil. Probably the number one reason anyone ever becomes an atheist. Obviously, I sympathize with the non-believer who says, why would I believe in an impure or incompetent God when a misunderstanding becomes a war or a child is molested, we would step in, even risk our own fragile bodies to help them. And that to me sounds like a genuinely Holy Spirit talking, the heart I'd like to see in a God. But I also sympathize with the believer here, those who try with all their might and despite all objections to hold fast to their faith, that deep self-skepticism that we ourselves don't know what's truly best, why things are the way they are. And the best we can do is keep the strong hope that there is some reason, purpose, and good end for all of this, and love the source of this life in spite of any impurity. This also sounds to me like a holy, pure spirit. Both the believer and the non-believer can carry some kernel of pure goodness. Where does this leave us? Not sure. Praying. 
one side of my heart says this. Come what if we spent our lives acting like this is a dream that all of us are sharing? Maybe even with other life forms. And we're trying to make the best dream of it that we can for each other. How could this not be the real test God put us to? If there is a God, I gave you this dream. Make it a good dream. All of my love, all of my joy, seems to want eternally. But the other side of my heart says, a wish, a dream, is not enough. The purest content would heal some wound, free a slave, pay a haunting debt, end some ancient dispute, make someone feel the boldness of love, end starvation, reassure a dying loved one, or better, raise the dead into perfect bodies, achieve a new ground of cosmic justice. And is that even remotely possible? Another fiction. Even if life were a dream, it ends, and suffering, evil, and death may just be built into the fabric of this world, facing alone a future of biblical proportions. Meanwhile, our species, united for the first time like so many religions dreamed of, and we want to do nothing more than be entertained as we rip it apart. Honestly, most of the time, I hate this world. I wake up every morning with a stomach full of dread. I hate being me. Sometimes I hate everyone I know. It feels like everything ends in death or a joke, and I'm sick of it. I'm kept up at night by this hopeless, screeching, evil, broken, ugly sadness. Like the world is living ruins, and there's nothing I can do to fix it. something. All I have is the fear and horror and sadness. I can't figure it out. I don't know what to do. No source revealed. No aim discovered, finitude in all directions. I have one more idea. Maybe nothing seems pure because my eyes aren't pure. I don't need new content. I need new eyes. Truth lies beyond. to full screen what's already full screen. Full screen cannot capture this. I look closely at a pot berry. It feels like I've never seen one. I feel like I've never seen one before. Like it's an alien. Keep you remembering something of some peak you remembering something of some peak expecting such a thing. Peak expecting such a thing. And no.
reference point back to my life. I might as well be on the other side of the universe. Am I a strange white primate? All these things Holding the cosmos together Keeping the blood flow of time starts to feel like an Alison Sholnick clay animated stream of consciousness. What is animating this cosmos? Where did matter, life, and thought emerge? Our bodies, all these things, seem to be tuning into something deeper, more primordial. Is this what music extends? One must learn to love. This is what happens to us in music. Protect and distinguish it, and isolate it, and we don't. Be patient with its appearance, and kind-hearted about its oddity. Finally, there comes a moment when we are used to it. We wait for it. A new and indescribable. indescribable. If this world had already been fully created in the past, it wouldn't be creation at all, just dictation. Is the world still being created? What do our bodies extend? First religion. Everything looks alive when life seems to be a very special form. I'm going back and forth wildly, black in the stars. How did this explode? It seems to stop. How did these apertures of life open in the first place? I have no answers. is this I'm being sucked into that old vortex <laughs> There is only one way to find out. 
about that great white light. If there's a God, an afterlife. And I have to find out. I have to try. This is for you. I'm coming home. Or is it only a voiceless wind? On Easter Island, weren't they starving to death? And they built those heads as a last appeal to the gods for help. And no one ever came. They left just the heads.
Every story ends the same way. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. And though the last light off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Thing as a perfect.